Good morning. Certainly good to see everybody on this Lord's Day. And anytime we gather on the Lord's Day, I'm reminded of, of the sorrow that Mary had as she went to the tomb on that first day of the week. Uh, a big portion of her life was over and, and taken from her. And she was hopeless. And she went to that tomb to further lament the passing of her son. And then she was asked the question, why seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but He is risen. And we're here this morning because He is risen. And it's a new and glorious day because of the hope that we have in that resurrection. We are saddened and have heavy hearts when we think of losing our sister as has been announced and the message has went out. But we're encouraged that her life is not defined by taking her last breath. But it's defined by the hope that she had and the faith that she had in Christ Jesus. And we praise God this morning that we also share that same faith and hope as a community of believers. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, and we're going to consider the thought this morning, a kingdom not of this world. A kingdom not of this world been talking about the Israel of God, the the nation of God, and and I think a lot of the misunderstanding concerning Israel is really founded in some concept of a premillennial state that we're living in, meaning we're we're, we're living before the thousand year reign of, of Christ, and somehow we're not living presently in the reign of Christ. I think as we look and see the Scriptures this morning, we'll understand, but furthermore, we'll rejoice in the fact that we're living in the kingdom of Christ. He is reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords today. He was asked concerning His kingship a few questions by Pilate. And of course, it was not on any ordinary night Or at any ordinary time, this is the time in which the plan was put into place to crucify Jesus the Christ. And in many ways, He's on trial. I say in many ways because this is not how they treated most prisoners. Verse 33, after the Jews have been greatly stirred up and they've went to Pilate making sure that He orders execution for Jesus... He entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you king of the Jews? Now I think he asked this question wanting to know. Please, give me an answer to the chaos that has erupted. Give me an answer to the disturbance that you have caused. Are you really king of the Jews? In verse 34, Jesus really turns it back as He often does and He asks a question. Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about Me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Notice how nobody's answered a question yet. They're just questioning back and forth to try to get on the level playing field. But I'm going to tell you, when you consider Jesus, you know what you have to consider and what's going to come up in the conversation? His kingship and His authority. Because that's what He had promised to be. Verse 35 continues and says, Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to Me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If My kingdom were of this world, my, My servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But My kingdom is not of this world. I think it's important that we understand that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. So important that in this evening of stress, Jesus says it not once but twice. My kingdom is not of this world. And I would say He said that to the Gentile who asked Him the question, but also so the Jews would hear and understand. He answers it for all people of every nation and language to understand that My kingdom is not of this world. And then Pilate said to him in verse 37, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born. And for this purpose I have come into the world 
to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And then Pilate shirks the responsibility of the words that Jesus uttered by saying to them, What is truth? And what question do people most commonly ask today? What is truth? It's relative to the generation, to the situation that you find yourself in. It's relative to the emotional state that you find yourself in. And so we shirk and we act as though truth is transient and can be changed. But truth cannot be changed. Truth cannot be altered. And what was true in that conversation was Jesus Christ was indeed a king. And here's what he says concerning his life, that he came to be a king. And we noticed last week in Isaiah chapter 55, what does it say concerning the word of God? That it will accomplish the purpose for which it was intended. For this purpose was I born. Wait a second. I thought Jesus had had a plan to redeem the Jews and then He had to change His plan because the Jews never accepted it. He accomplished the purpose for which He had been sent and He had been sent to do what? To establish a kingdom. And He accomplished that which He had been sent to do. Furthermore, what He says about His kingdom is He says, My kingdom is not of this world. Meaning, my, my kingdom is not of the flesh. My kingdom cannot be seen. My kingdom is out of this world. My kingdom is beyond this world. And what he goes on to say, as as only he could do, is he perceives exactly what one would do if they were living in an earthly kingdom. And he says, if, which it's not, but if my kingdom were of this world, my followers would fight this very day. Meaning, since my kingdom is not of this world, my people will not wage war. And because I am the eternal and everlasting King sent from God the Father, I have no need that anyone would fight my battles for me. But I am King of kings and Lord of lords, and my word and my truth shall prevail without the help of the followers. But yet... The world is plagued with this concept that indeed in the future the participants in the kingdom will fight. And that there will be a kingdom set up in a geographical location. And those who are followers of Christ will somehow wage war as if He needed us to do so. And at that time He will set up His millennial kingdom and kingship all in an aim to redeem the remnant of Israel. Paul would say in Romans 11 verse 5 that remnant exists when? Today. In this present age. At this time. We'll think more about that concept. But Jesus clearly says here, my kingdom is not of this world. And if my kingdom were of this world, it would look totally different. But since it is not, I will submit to you this very hour, Pilate, And I will allow you to have your men beat me. And I will allow them to put that crown of thorns on my head. And I will hang upon that tree. And I will be called cursed. Because my kingdom is not of this world. He was indeed setting up a kingdom. It was promised that that's exactly what Jesus would do. That's also exactly what would happen during this period of time. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. The prophet Daniel is prophesying to a group of people in captivity. They're in captivity because they've been judged by God. And while Daniel is there in captivity, he he has a different state or position as most people do that have been taken captive. He's he's actually uh, one of the few who are in the king's court. And King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and and it... perplexes him or troubles him. And no one can, of course, interpret the dream or make an understanding of the dream. Verse 36, Daniel comes on the scene and we're familiar with the story. Daniel says, This was a dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, 
and in whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beast of the field, and the birds of the heaven, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. You are the head of gold. How do we start to understand this, this prophecy or this vision that is shown to us in Daniel chapter 2? How, how do we understand how far reaching this may be? How far does the timeline go? How, how, how far does the dispensation go? Well, to answer that question, we must say, where does this vision start? And Daniel himself tells us where this vision starts. It starts in the present day. In the day in which Daniel was living, when Nebuchadnezzar was king, because he says, you, O Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold. The next two kingdoms that, that follow or are represented in this dream, Daniel chapter 8 would elaborate on that and tell us the exact kingdoms that were under consideration there. That kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. And then after them would arise what? The great king out of Greece. And so those two kingdoms are named. Therefore we know the timeline goes like this. Babylon, the Medes and the Persians, and then who follows? The Greeks. Who said that? The Holy Spirit through the prophet Daniel. So the Holy Spirit has limited how far out we can take this vision or this dream. And what kingdom followed the Greeks? The Roman Empire. And so we would be doing a disservice to the text here if we took this prophecy beyond the Roman Empire. Because Daniel has made it clear that he's speaking first and primarily to those in the Babylonian Empire. Those in Babylonian captivity. And then he brings about this fourth kingdom. Verse 43 of chapter 2. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix well with clay. And we saw that. All the previous kingdoms and nations, Rome, kind of borrowed from those ideas. And it didn't mix well. It lasted for a long time, but it didn't mix well. There was always friction and problems. Verse 44, And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. When's the kingdom that, that, that has been promised and the kingdom that we all want to be a part of? The kingdom that's been under consideration this entire month from this pulpit. When shall it be established? In the days of the Roman Empire it shall be established. When was Jesus having that great conversation concerning His kingship? In the days of the Roman Empire. So is Jesus going to establish His kingdom in a later date? No, in the days of those kings, the kingdom shall be established. It shall never be destroyed. It will never change. It shall not be given to another people, but it shall be given to the people of which it was intended to be granted unto. And it was intended to be given to the, all those who would call upon the name of the Lord. And that call would be to all people from all nations. And we'll see that in the prophet Isaiah. It shall break into pieces, continuing here in verse 44, all these kingdoms and bring them to an end and it shall stand forever. Because it was directed by God. This one is different. When Peter would preach concerning this kingdom and, and concerning the prophets that would tell of this coming kingdom, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 24 he says that all the prophets spoke unto these days. When was Peter alive and when was he preaching the message of the kingdom in the days of the Roman Empire? Devin, you're, you're shortchanging God when you limit those prophecies to only being fulfilled in Christ Jesus and in the days of the Roman Empire. That's not what I've done, but that's what Peter the inspired apostle did when he said as much as he's proclaiming the gospel message, he says that all the prophets spoke towards these last days. And they would be fulfilled in Christ because Christ said what unto Pilate? I came to reign as a king. And oh, was the kingdom in need of a king. Let's turn in our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 11. 
Isaiah goes back a little bit in the timeline of Israel. Daniel was prophesying to them after they had received the judgment that Isaiah promised them would come their way. But through his writings, Isaiah is, is speaking to a people who have at this time in their lives re mightily rejected God. They have rejected God mostly because their kings also had rejected God. And thinking about the nation of Judah as their kings that were reigning, their kings were reigning and they were through the Davidic lineage. 1 Chronicles 17, after David had committed a great sin and he was in many ways hopeless, God through a prophet gives him hope. That a descendant of yours shall sit on the throne forever. And that would start through the, the, the lineage of Judah. But what we would find is that those kings would be imperfect. You think about Ahaz, who, who Isaiah had a direct conversation with. He was stubborn. Even in his last days, he would not turn to the Lord, but he shut the, de the doors of the temple. This is 11 in verse 1 of Isaiah. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is interesting. Why is it just a stump? I mean, we're, we're talking about the, the king that would come to rule the kingdom of God. And he's being born from a what? A stump. But the promise had been there for a long time, even starting all the way back in Genesis chapter 49, right? The scepter shall not depart from Judah. And then the promise again in 1 Chronicles 17 is given to David. By this time it should have grown into a grand and glorious tree. And from that tree should spring forth a king that would rule forever. But it wasn't that way. It was a stump. And just a stump. Why? Because the kings were useless. The kings didn't appreciate what they had before them. And they had made the Israel of God a laughingstock among all nations. They had been taken into Babylonian captivity and had no longer even had the funds to rebuild their own temple. But that group which had previously enslaved them had to fund the rebuilding of their own temple. They had really left the house desolate and a mere stump. But from that stump sprang forth the one that had been promised. The king that indeed had been promised. Continuing here in verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon Him, that is, Jesus the Christ, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And indeed it was upon the Christ and we see Him with wisdom and acting with counsel. And we see Him filled with the Spirit in the conversations that He has. Let's go back a bit to chapter 9 of Isaiah. Chapter 9 of Isaiah. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, He brought into content the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, He has made glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the nations, or translated Galilee of the Gentiles. This is chapter 9 of Isaiah prophesying again to a rebellious group of people. They're described in this manner in verse 22 of chapter 8. And they will look on the earth, but behold, distress, darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. They've chosen not to walk according to the paths of righteousness, but walk in their own ways. And therefore, in the latter time, things need to change. In the times to come, things need to change. And glory will indeed be there, but it will be beyond the Jordan. And I find that interesting as you think about that Israel, that promised land, but now in the latter days, the promise will not only be in that area, in that promised land, but beyond the Jordan. In the land of the Gentiles, will now be the promises. And the glory of the Lord shall go forth from Zion unto all nations, even beyond the Jordan it shall go. Continuing here in verse 3, You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, 
as they are glad when they divide the spoil. In the latter times, there is something coming that is grand and it is glorious because, verse 6 says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The peace that had escaped them in verse 22 was promised to them in this future king. The government would be upon his shoulder. He would bring in a new government. He would be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting, just as the everlasting kingdom would later be prophesied through the mouth of David or Daniel. And the everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, and over His kingdom to establish and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This will be accomplished because of the will of the Lord. And there will be peace and a kingdom shall be established. Let's go back in verse, chapter 2. See what Isaiah has to say concerning this kingdom that would come. It shall come to pass in verse 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days. That's the same latter days referenced in verse 1 of chapter 9. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the house of of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And so indeed in the latter days things would change. But Jerusalem would play a huge part. Jerusalem would be the springboard for all that would go forth into the nations to redeem the nations. It would be in Jerusalem that the Lord was crucified, He died. It would be in Jerusalem that He was raised and He would speak to His people. It would be in Jerusalem that He would say unto His followers, and those would be His apostles, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be My witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where it would start. Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's go back into chapter 11 of Isaiah. Chapter 11 of Isaiah, and we'll be starting here in verse 9. In these latter days that have been promised, these latter days when the lineage of David has been preserved for His people, verse 9 says, They shall not hurt or destroy in all My holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples. That's exactly what he told Nicodemus he was. He was a signal for the peoples. He would be raised up as, as the bronze serpent was raised in the wilderness. And He would be a signal. Of Him shall nations inquire. And His resting place shall be glorious. It could also be translated of, of Him the Gentiles would seek. Paul would later reference this in Romans chapter 15 and verse 8 when he closes that grand epistle trying to help those in Rome understand this concept that, 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 that Israel is indeed desolate. Not because God wanted to desert them, but because they were unwilling to accept Jesus the Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 11, In that day the Lord will extend out His hand yet a second time to recover the remnant, the remains of His people. A second time, meaning the promised captivity that Isaiah was talking about God would stretch out His hand and redeem a remnant. They would, he would pull a remnant. Not all those who were taken into Babylonian captivity would return to their homeland, but a remnant would return. And in these days, in these latter days, He extends out His hand yet a second time. And we know that that extending of the hand was indeed Jesus the Christ, because Isaiah would also say, And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To who has He outstretched His hand? Well, what is the arm of the Lord? That twig, the root of Jesse, would be born to redeem and call back the people. And that day, verse 11 again, and that day the Lord will extend His hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of His people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, 
and from the coastlands of the sea. And again, Romans 11 and verse 5 speaks to the fact that we are now living in the time when the remnant is yet again preserved. The remnant remains today. Verse 12, He will raise a signal for the nations and He will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. When should that happen but in the kingdom that Jesus the Christ would establish? Let's close our thoughts in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The Hebrew writer here is speaking to a group of people who would have been familiar with the prophecies that we just looked at. They, they would have known that a kingdom was coming. And, and what he says is that that message has now been confirmed with words that we write in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Verse 18 of chapter 12. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. You have not come to what may be touched. That sounds a lot like it's alluding to the words that Jesus spoke to Pilate, right? My kingdom is not of this world. It cannot be touched. It cannot be held. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the words made the hearers beg that no further message would be spoken to them. What is this talking about? It's talking about the original giving of the law in Exodus chapter 19. When it was a scary place to be. Mount, Mount Sinai was a scary place to be. When the law was given, there was fear and there was trembling, but that's not what we've come to. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, chapter 1 and verse 1, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, the, the last days that Isaiah promised we would be a part of, in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom He also created the world. And so we're being spoken to in this kingdom, not by the prophets of old, because Christ has fulfilled that and completed their words, but we're being spoken to by Jesus Christ Himself. Continuing in verse 20, For they could not endure the order that was given, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering. Well, wait, wait a second. The, the inspired word says we're, we're a part of what today? We're a part of the heavenly Jerusalem today? We're a part of, of the promised land today? There's no future revelation that's coming that's going to call us all to some magical Mount Zion? But we're there today, as a Hebrew writer would say. And if we were there when He wrote those words and it was indeed an everlasting kingdom that was established, then we're living in that kingdom today. The rest of Hebrews 12 is going to speak to us in two ways. It's going to speak to us in two ways. It's going to speak to us that because we're in this kingdom, we're joyful. And we sing praises and there's no longer gloom and there's no longer heartache. And there's no longer stress. That we're a different looking type of people because we understand the kingdom we're in. So I ask myself the question, why, why is it that there's so much confusion over the kingdom that we're a part of today? Could it be because of us? Could it be because we don't live joyful enough lives? Could it be because we don't talk about Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords enough? Could it be that we have to go to church on Sunday morning and it disrupts our schedule so bad? And we become that type of people? Could we be part of the problem of the message of the kingdom being unclear when we're supposed to be a people that get to go to church and we can't wait to get there to worship with the called out and the elect? Because the Hebrew writer here says, when you understand the kingdom that you're a part of, you're a different person entirely. Isaiah would say as much that they started singing songs loudly and clearly and joyfully because they knew of the coming kingdom that they could be a part of. That's the first challenge that the Hebrew writer gives us here in chapter 12 of Hebrews. Secondly, he gives this. If you're not in this kingdom, you're going to be judged. There's terrible judgment coming your way. 
And so what we need to evaluate this morning is how are we living? Are we really preaching the kingdom? Are we preaching the fact that we have an everlasting kingdom with our lives? Or do our lives reflect the fact that we're slaves? And if we're not a part of this kingdom, understand that judgment is coming our way. Verse 22 again, But you have come to a Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks to a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel was slain and he died and someone else had to fight for him and bring justice for him. But Jesus the Christ died and conquered death himself. Needing not what Abel needed. Abel needed someone to judge the one whom had killed him. But Jesus the Christ himself will judge the ones that killed him. And therefore his blood speaks more powerfully of that. Verse 25, See that you do not refuse Him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused Him who was warned on the earth, much less will we escape if we reject Him who warns from heaven. We're being warned from heaven. Verse 26, At that time His voice shook the earth, but now He has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. There's a great day coming, and that's what this message has turned to in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 27, this phrase, yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God more acceptable worship with reverence and awe. He challenges our worship once we've come to an understanding of the kingdom that we're part of, and it cannot be shaken because why? My kingdom is not of this world. And therefore, you can't find the kingdom on a map and you can't find the kingdom through your bloodline. Because all of that can be shaken and changed, but that which is unchangeable is what makes you a part of this kingdom. For our God is a consuming fire. Where are you today? Are you in the kingdom? And if you're in the kingdom, are you living like you're in the kingdom? Are you worshiping Him with reverence and awe? If you're not right with God for any reason at all, please make your wishes known to this congregation as together we stand and as we sing. Amen. This world is not my home. I'm just.